Hey, I hope you had a really great Thanksgiving. I know I did. It's fantastic. I love this time of the year. And I love doing my half marathons on Thanksgiving when permissible and when it happens and when everything comes together for me. So it's fantastic. I hope you had a good one. Hope you enjoyed the meal with family or perhaps on your own or perhaps you had to go to work, which uh, many times I've had to do that, too. But anyway, I have a great show today. This is awesome. I got to speak with Tom Paxton, the very legendary folk musician, along with another legend, John McCutcheon. This is John's third appearance on this podcast. Actually, John was my first guest three and a half years ago as I speak for this episode. So I hope you have a really good time. And I want to thank everybody who got this one together. It's never easy getting uh, two people together, especially two wonderfully talented people like that. We had a great time. And we talk about their new project. It's called Together, full of great music. We really get into that. Good new album. Get it wherever you get music. I'd like to have a very serious, nice shout out to my very, very good old chum, good old friend of mine. His name is Chuck Fink. And he is also, he's a Cleveland legend. Yes, you are a legend, Chucky. Just stop it. I'm going to give you that label. He has been uh, a folk musician himself for many years in the Cleveland, Ohio area. He's always out there performing. So check him out. Chuck Fink, F-I-N-K. And uh, his birthday is around this point in the year. So happy birthday to him. Anyway, Hope you have a good time listening to this. John McCutcheon and Tom Paxton have a lot of great memories working with some of the biggest legends in folk music. Enjoy. Doing this hobby on my own time has always been a lot of fun. This has been born out of the pandemic. So just been having a really good time doing that and living here in Atlanta. And finally, it uh, finally has cooled off. Well, it's supposed um, to be a warmer over the weekend, but anyway. Yeah nice it's been really really nice so you guys are both in atlanta you can stick your head out the window and shout <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah. yeah i'm a little come north on of down yeah. come on down tom yeah hot so, land. Hot land. so bob what do you want to talk about today the new project let's let's promote this wonderful thing it's called together and how did it come together this is just really a fascinating i just listened to it on amazon music and just a really great project it's it sounds like this was a a really heavy lift working through zoom and then finally getting together so yeah just from the top uh how did this all come together we found out that our uncle had a barn and we could put on a show uh <laughs> We had Judy Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney, and uh, yeah, they both they both died, and uh, <laughs> we're the last ones. I remember those two. Yeah, yeah. We uh, we we've been pals for a very long time, and it, you know it, it, when you're pan, you're you always say, you know, why don't we get together sometime and do it? And the pandemic kind of said, uh, what else are you gonna do? You know, so <laughs> well, we got together. Yeah, it, it also made it convenient because in the past, when you were going to co-write with somebody, you were in the same room. And being as we don't live in the same town. Um, and I think we're both people who don't like to be bored. And no. uh, and this new technology, I mean, we had to learn so much new technology. I mean, I mean we musicians were the first ones to lose our jobs and the last mm -hmm. ones to get them back. And so in the meantime, we had to kind of figure out how do we keep the wolf from the door? Uh, how do we scratch that itch that is, um, you know, want to do creative things? And then, you know, you want to see your pals and all of a sudden you could do it for free. <laughs> Where do you get the inspiration? And, uh, it's, yeah. Oh, that's, uh, that's at once uh, the, 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 myst the mystery of it all and the easiest part of it is, the mid, the, where do you get the inspiration is you say, uh, I need an idea. Uh, what's an idea? And there it is. Uh, the ideas come if you're looking for them. Seek and you shall find, you know, somebody once said. Um, and it's true. Uh, uh, 
if you're looking for songs, you find songs. And even when you can't come up with something, I mean, on the album, there's the song Same Old Crap, which is the result of not, you know, we both said, I don't know, I don't have anything. Okay, that's the first line. I'm looking at the page, and I got nothing. And somehow, you know, you just follow the, the songs. Um, I think with some people, they feel like there has to be a storyboard there, and you're kind of almost dictating the whole thing. Uh, one of the things I think that Tom and I share is, is we're willing to use the pen as a flashlight more than as a mere dictation device, to quote Billy Collins. And so you, you can find, you know, all of a sudden it was, oh, I guess I'll sing the same old crap tonight. Or, yeah. or like Life Before You, it was, oh, we don't have to go to the predictable end here. Let's let's surprise ourselves and the listener. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a really scrappy uh, tune. I really like that vibe. Yeah. <laughs> Same old crap today. Uh, well, you just imagine what it's like when you're starting off and you got no audience. You're playing in some noisy place where people have not paid to come see you um, and they're drinking and they're visiting with their friends and there's a jukebox and it's a pool table and there's a television on and 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 there's you um thank god both go of us are that. <laughs> just go out go out go out there and have a good time yeah <laughs> just 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 be yourself it's a glamorous life yeah were you if always like that the- though you know, always like, hey, you know, uh, I don't care anymore. I mean, were you obviously a little bit more conscientious when you were far younger starting out as compared to now? It's like, let's just go out there and have fun. Well, I think we don't get at, offered the demeaning jobs that we had to take back then. Yeah. And Tom, to I me, mean- to me, there's nothing worse than a bar gig. Um, uh, uh, one of my ta- one of my dows is uh, you have never played your last bar gig. You, you may think you have, uh, you may swear you have, but sure as hell you're gonna come come to someday and find yourself in the middle of a bar gig with nobody paying attention and, and uh, just hell. Uh, I I hate it when I see young performers playing bar gigs because. I mean, it's even worse than busking. Uh, it's it's soul destroying. Mm. You 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 you're singing to people who don't give a shit about you, yeah. or what you have to say, or anything you know, and the horse you rode in on, um, and that that's awful. Um, uh, well, Tom, busking you- is yeah. busking's almost as bad. But the people at least are indifferent as they walk past. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the bar gigs, they hate you. <laughs> well, Tom, how, was was there any of that vibe when you started off back in the village? You know, back, Bob, you may not know, but Tom was one of the the original folk crew. I mean, Going back to Greenwich Village. And did you share an yeah. apartment with, uh, with Noel Paul Stuckey? Going I did. Then. Not yeah. only Noel Paul Suki, but also Wavy Gravy. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, the vibe there was wonderful. Um, it was a great place to be a young performer because people cared. People came to the village to hear you and discover you. Um, I can't tell you how many people come up to me and say, you know, I saw you at the Gaslight. Wow. And uh, Gaslight was home. It was, it was, it was a friendly place to be. And uh, you you loved all the other performers and and you learned from them. And, you know, someone like Phil Oaks would uh, gladly critique your song and then sing one for you, for your opinion. and there was a lot of that. Of course, there was competition, uh, but the competition was uh, friendly, supportive, 
They wanted, you know, we all wanted the best for each other. It's a, it sounds idyllic, but it pretty near was. Yeah. Yeah. And supportive of each other and, and yeah. building yeah. the music. Yeah. That's right. And, and hey, how, how did you play that lick? Oh, yeah. let me show you. I'll and, show or, you. Or Dylan presenting you with the lyrics to Hard Rain's Gonna Fall and saying, what should I do with this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I told him to put a tune to it. And now when it goes into the sixth or seventh minute, I think, what was I thinking? You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding there. I love that song. I think it's a brilliant I, song. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I was kind of a, 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 the, gener the next generation after. I mean, we're only separated by about 15 years. But I was growing up in northern Wisconsin, which was a long bus ride from the gaslight. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sure. And, and listening to this music on, on record, I mean, the first time I ever heard a Tom Paxson song was I got a, uh, an album that is, oh, darn, you can't see it. It's hanging on my wall. It's the recording of Pete Seeger's concert in, in, at Carnegie Hall in 1963. Uh, where he sang, Hard Rain's Gonna Fall, and he sang, What Did You Learn in School Today? Um, which was the first Tom Paxton song I ever uh, heard and learned. Um, yeah. And and here we are all those years later. It's a long time from 1963. Wow. Uh, Has it? Yeah. Before uh, we yeah. lost President Kennedy. And, and didn't you present uh, Ramblin' Boy to uh, Pete Seeger for that show? I did. I did. Uh, not long after I wrote it. Um that was in 63. And uh, I said, uh, well, it was at, after a rally that we had at the Village Gate, which was a large venue that uh, few of us had played. It was mainly people a little further up the, the, the food chain played the Village Gate. You know, Leon Bibb or uh, uh, Miriam McCabe, people like that. Um, but I, I had opened for uh, for uh, Mary McCabe at the Village Gate, and, and we had this magazine, a uh, mimeograph magazine that came out monthly called Broadside. That was all new songs that we wrote, and we had a fundraiser every every month on a Sunday afternoon. Art Delugov gave us uh, the club to have these rallies or these these benefits, and. Uh, and so we used it to have a rally to uh, start a boycott of the Hootenanny television show because they were blacklisting Pete. Uh, they lied and said they weren't. Uh, they <laughs> they said, no, 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 we're not blacklisting Pete. We just don't have to go. We don't think he could hold an audience. <laughs> <laughs> this, you know, the, this is the man who had, oh, wow. you know, Carnegie Hall singing. Yeah. Uh, with him. Um, and so Pete came and typically tried to talk us out of it. He said, you know, it's it's good for folk music to have a big, you know, network show like this and, and good for it. We said, thanks a lot, Pete, but we're still going to boycott it. Well, after that rally was over, I went, I went up to Pete kind of nervously. Um, I was in awe of the man. And I, and I said, uh, Pete, could I sing you a song that I just wrote? And, and he said, sure, let's, let, let's hear it. And I sang it to him, and he went and sang it a couple of weeks later in Carnegie Hall with the Weavers on a recording. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, was, I, was I excited by that? And uh, as we said in Oklahoma, you know, I didn't know whether to shit or vote Republican. Uh, uh, I was really excited. That was that was the big imprimatur for me. Uh, I mean, people, you know, said, "Well, if Pete Seeger is singing your songs. I guess we'll hire you." Um, it was a wonderful moment for me. Oh, the Weavers, yes, they put out a documentary. It must be almost forty years since that documentary. Oh, I've never yeah. seen yeah. on a big screen. Wow, what a great documentary on them. Yeah. I remember by the way uh, it, since he had just learned the song he got it slightly wrong <laughs> and he sang uh, fare thee well my rambling boy 
instead of here's to you. A big difference. I mean, uh, I mean, a big deal to me. I, I couldn't have cared less. I was so excited. But he, he did get it slightly wrong. And then right after that recording, uh, he took his family on a year's sabbatical. And they went around the world. And, and uh, I got this postcard from Pete after the album came out. I got this postcard from Pete from uh, Calcutta. Uh, and, it was, and it was signed with a little drawing of a banjo that he always drew on his correspondence. And, and it said, Dear Tom, oops, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I don't have that card. I wish I did. Yeah, Pete was a great writer. I mean, if you wrote to Pete as oh. a as a friend or a fan, yeah, he, he would. Well, I remember when I lived in Charlottesville, he was there for the Virginia Book Festival, and he and Toshi came and ate at the house. And I just got back from Australia, and he said, "Now, John, I know you can't come to the concert tonight because you'll be home answering all your mail." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "No, Pete, I'll be there." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. He he sent me uh, once uh, one of his songbooks, and he inscribed it very nicely, very gently. And so I I sent him my uh, songbook back, and I said uh, to Pete, on whose aching shoulders I have stood for fifty years, Tom. <laughs> he he was a giver, he a certainly- giver. And uh, uh, conscious of being an elder and a mentor, he was, I mean, yeah. I, for the first time I met him, which was in 1973, uh, he was sitting in, sitting on the ground at a festival that I was playing at, and he came back and he gave me some advice and never stopped for the next 45, 50 yeah. years. Yeah. And, and it was not just how to be a better performer, but it was how to do this work better. Hmm. Yeah. What kind of tips did uh, Pete Seeger give you as far as like performing? Eh? Like you know, how, how you look to the audience? Did he give you technique uh, tips? Well, for me, hmm. um, it was at that point in my career, I was I, I was playing a dozen instruments. It was like a it was like a circus on stage. And he said, um, I don't think you need so many things to do the most important work. And it really made me focus on the music yeah. rather than, hey, look what I can do. Um, yeah, it's less is more. There you go. Right. And yeah. in, a, in a. I think the, the main lesson I learned from Pete is to go there, mm-hmm. go all the way to the last row of the people, uh, go to the balcony, uh, go out from yourself out um and no one ever did that better than pete oh i I remember when i bought that that album that we both referred to i'd never been to a concert i'd never heard a pete seeger record i just wanted this it was the album was called we shall overcome and I had heard that song and I was really fascinated by it because it sounded like a hymn, but I knew it couldn't be a hymn because every hymn I knew had singular pronouns. And We Shall Overcome was all about the plural. And I got it home and it was a concert and, I, and it was the audience was singing. Yeah. And it, it, I'm not just singing, it was full throated harmony and you were part of a choir and it was a, not only did Pete reach everybody, he brought everybody in. And at the end of the concert, it was just like, wow, listen to what we just did. Yeah. And there wasn't you, you know, of, What's you that? know, of course, they, they, they salted the mine a little bit. They had oh, they, some, yeah, a yeah. lot of great singers on stage, uh, stage seats, uh, being picked up by that microphone. And, uh, uh, I, I don't know who everybody was, but they were all really great singers. And it was brilliant, really. And oh, yeah, yeah. growing up a little Catholic kid, I didn't know human, <laughs> I didn't know human beings could sound like that. Yeah, yeah. 
great to get to know people like that too. You know, it was so funny. I, for years I worked with uh, Fred Hellerman's son. I worked wow. on television. I was like, what? I didn't know until after he left. I, 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 you know, I'm reading the obituary in the New York times. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't know that he didn't say a word to me about a Caleb as a son. So it's yeah. like, I'll get along thing with the weavers. I remember getting say not say not say not. That was the first single that I, yeah. the weavers, my, my dad got that for me. Well, the, the weavers at Carnegie hall album changed my life. I mean, I, by the, by the time I got to the end of side two, uh, I, I had a chance to tell every one of them, uh, thank you for ruining my life. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I underwent chromosomal change. Uh, that um, I went from someone who loved this stuff and became someone who had to do it. And they put me on the path I'm still on. And oh, that, that's such a familiar story. Yeah. Tom and Harry Chapin both said, we heard that, yeah. said, that's what we want to do. Pete and, and Peter Yarrow was at that concert. Was he, was he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny when you, after you've been a performer for a long time, when you hear the story, you hear it in a different way than most people hear it. I mean, Harold Leventhal, their manager, told about going to, he went to uh, town hall and said, I want to do a concert with the Weavers. And they said, well, I'm sorry, we can't do that. Uh, the blacklist was right. still going on. And he went to Carnegie Hall and said, I want to do a concert with the Weavers. And they said, do you have the money? And he said, I do. And so they gave him uh, Christmas Eve, 1956. And after a while, as a performer, you say, wait a minute. Christmas Eve, that's the worst possible night of year to try to do a concert. It's Christmas Eve. No one goes any place but, you know, church or home or and of course, every lefty west uh, east of the Mississippi, they snapped up the tickets so fast. It sold out very quickly, I think. And uh, you can hear it in the audience, uh, the, the enthusiasm, the, the love for the weavers. Well, um, and, and really the blacklist really helped create the current iteration of the folk music world. Sure did. Because all of a sudden, Pete couldn't get work in nightclubs and I mean, he left the Weavers and Tosha got on the phone and called every college folk song society, every, you know, yeah. every Unitarian church, every, and, yeah. and those, those little, and playing all those places created the folk music circuit. And certainly when I started out, th those places were the places that hired me. Yeah, amazing. They, they oh, came so, so Toshi Seeger and Joe McCarthy created my job. Those, <laughs> yeah. are, those, are, those are two names you often so, don't hear used. Now, John, what was the first song uh, that you and I wrote for this album? Oh. Was it, was it uh, you know, uh, you know, I can actually, I'm at my computer, so I can actually. Little. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think it was Ukraine. Um, I think Campfire actually came before that. Is that right? <laughs> Let me look at my with Paxton folder. Um, it, uh, good to see you if you have to go. Oh, this is really some interesting stuff. Because you got a hundred songs there, right? There throughout. Oh, this is just in 2021. Wow. Um, uh, uh, you know, Ukraine, we, we wrote Ukraine in 2022 because that was, uh -huh. when, was when the invasion happened in February. So it was early on. It was early on. Uh -huh. It was certainly one of them that when we wrote it, we went, oh, well. Yeah. That, this is going to work. Yeah. That, that, this is going to work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. also... Tom and I share a lot of approaches. We both written a lot of topical songs. I mean, Linda Johnson told the nation is, yeah. is iconic and born on the 4th of July and Jimmy Newman. I mean, all those great songs that came out of the, the Vietnam war area era. Um, yeah. and, and also 
we like to write funny songs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not a lot of writers do that. I mean, there's, there's weird Al, that's all he does, but it's, it's really hard to write funny songs to, to write sure. a song like same old crap. Every verse has to, ha- has to be funny. You can't yeah. make people wait for a punchline. Um, or you tell you what, two great, uh, 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 Masters for me are uh, 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 Tom Lear and Shel Silverstein. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, I knew I knew Shel. I only met Tom Lear once, very briefly, but I, I, I was friends with Shel, and we wrote a couple songs together uh, on one occasion. They didn't turn out to be uh, good stuff. But I loved him, and I think he was one of the very best songwriters I've known. I mean, and he, his, his mantra was payoff. It has to pay off. A right. verse have to pay off. The last line of the verse has to tie it all together. What that verse has been about, <laughs> and and uh, in other words, it needs a punchline. You know, you need a punchline in a funny song the way you need it in the joke. And it comes last. It comes but, last. But you can't, uh, but you have to have something in every verse that, absolutely. Sus- that sustains that. Uh, and that, and, and yeah. in, in that way, when, when we're writing together, writing a song that isn't intended to be funny, the last line of every verse is your landing line. It's, it's, it has to work right. too, you know? Yeah. Take a verse from Charlie on the MTA. Mm-hmm. His wife comes down to the Kendall's air station every day at a quarter past two and through the open window, she hands Charlie and a Charlie song, a which fan. is the train come hurrying <laughs> through, uh, you know, a little story in itself. Yeah. Yeah. With the sting in the tail. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You, you you make them laugh, and then you, you have some teeth to it too. Sure, nice, nice. That that opening track, Ukrainian. Now you got a nice cast of characters in that, and the video really captures everybody. Oh yeah, in there. oh yeah. yeah. Noel Stuckey did that. Yeah, he did. Noel Stuckey's the one who put the put the video together. My old roomie. Great guy. Met him backstage at Chastain Theater over here yeah. in in Atlanta. Really, really great guy. And you'll never you meet at- a better one. Yeah, yeah, just incredibly talented. Peter, of course, you know, we, we always go on about uh, topical things as well. There's always sure. something, always something to be going on about. But were you at Peter Paul Mary's rehearsal for one of their first songs? Was it Don't Think Twice, It's All Right? Do you remember them? No, no, I was it? rooming with Noel when they were putting, yeah, and and Peter uh, Peter would come over to, uh, I was living with Noel, it was his apartment on uh, East Fifth Street between B and C, which was, I mean, it was junky city. Uh, they, you know, they would regularly clean out our apartment. Um, and Peter would come over there and they would work on the guitar parts. And uh, one memorable night that kept me up for hours working on the part for Lemon Tree for the first album. And I've hated the song ever since. <laughs> Lemon tree, very bad. God damn, yeah, it was <laughs> awful. But um, it, we had a lot of fun. And we, uh, with it. I mean, we'd usually wind up down in Chinatown at two in the morning. And uh, 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 great days, great days. Yeah, and it got heavier through the 60s as, as the war raged on. It got sure, sure intense. it did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great cast in, in in Ukrainian now. It just you know it, it's fun. You know these things are still going on. We still have a lot of war yeah. going on now, even more so than back then. So you, plenty of material to uh, to draw from. Oh yeah, and people. And- some some people accused Peter Paul and Mary uh, of selling out. You know, and but Peter Paul and Mary made the march from. Uh, uh, Selma to Montgomery, all of it, every step of it. Um, uh, they didn't get beat up, but they were on the march and that they didn't miss. It. And the, none of those critics uh, were there. They were. 
they walk the walk. And and I think there's there's a pretty common cultural habit of you know you discover this artist in a small club. Yeah. And all of a sudden they're playing Carnegie Hall and they've sold out because yeah. You, you wanted them for yourself, right? Yeah, you yeah. It, you saw it with Springsteen. You saw it with all kinds of people. Yeah, certainly with Dylan. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally, yeah. But there's, you know, you want to grow as an artist too, and a lot of yeah. people don't understand that. But you know, time goes on. You want to explore oh. other avenues and genres. And yeah. Bill Monroe went through it. Um, uh, Astor Piazzolla, the great. Tango master from Argentina, he went through it. And he sure. tried to step out of the step out of the lane of of something old and sacred. Uh the apostasy yeah. is thrown out. Yeah, I yeah. mean, we we're at Tom, I wanted to tell you I wanted to tell you that that I've been working on Tabernacle today, uh, which is a song that we wrote after, oh, yeah. after the uh Hamas invasion hmm. of of uh uh, Israel and uh, it's all about you know it's from an Israeli point of view but it reaches out beyond you know yeah. when death comes it's no different for an Arab or for a Muslim or a Jew but the using the Kaddish and the sitting Shiva for the whole world so you know the stuff presents so, itself yeah. and you, you try Topic, to yeah. how to be how to be um honest and pete and lots of other people taught us how to be brave and and also that you don't have the answers you know you just want to present questions in really yeah in yeah really, yeah really prof in, in, intriguing and provocative ways so i think i've got a melody tom so i'll, I'll send it to you ah oh, great nice. great great amazing yeah we never we, ne plugs. we never stop it never stops. It never stops. Nor should it. No, here we are. I mean, you know, most people our age are sensibly retired. <laughs> yeah. But we've never There's been. Nothing retired. about this that is good sense. <laughs> no, no. None of we've this ever made good of, sense. We've never been accused of that. Yeah, but it's very good to keep your mind going. Like we were saying earlier, it's just you're you're giving yourself good mental exercise, and I think that's what staves off you know things like dementia or Alzheimer's or whatever those things are. Not a hundred percent cure or or prevention, but it does keep My you friends going. Have and, frozen. Yeah. Uh, it, well, and the um, and it, uh, no matter what your job is. No yeah. matter what your job is, you want to be helpful. Yeah, yeah. Useful for as long as you can. And yeah, absolutely. And yeah. it doesn't matter whether you're a you know a guy who is a an electrician or a policeman or a teacher, as long as you can keep being useful. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And 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 you're still producing, you're still writing and recording. And that's that's really important too. Not just doing the live performing, but it's really nice to uh just keep yourself active. Absolutely. Well, and it's what we it's what we do. Um yeah. And uh here's Tom again. Yeah, yeah. Something we've we got three here going. So yeah, it looks like you're all back there and not frozen. Yeah. Yet. The it's internet the can be a tricky the thing. of the internet. <laughs> you guys just froze up. It got too tense for you. And you... No, I didn't. We, we were so in awe. <laughs> <laughs> the computers are smoking here. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. Too much history. <laughs> well, there, so, this, this was a really fun project to do, not only because, you know, we had we have well over a hundred songs. We're going in the studio again oh, yeah. uh, later this year uh, to do another one. Um, but just to decide what makes kind of a well-rounded connection of collection of, uh, of music, what can people stand to listen to? What things do we want to talk about? What overall story can it tell? And it was great to finally get in the same room together after being like yeah. this on Zoom for so long. 
Yeah, yeah. And with the uh, production uh, uh, abilities of Bob Dawson and yourself, John. And oh, boy. It's just now, where did you record? At, at his studio, Bias Studio in um, in Springfield, Springfield. Yeah. It's, a, it's a suburb of the D.C. area. Hmm. And it's um, it's one of the best studios in the world. And what makes it one of the best studios in the world is Bob Dawson. Yeah, it's I'm, just inside the Beltway. Right. So we uh, I've, I've recorded there for, you know, since the early 1980s. Um, I have too. Um, I've, I've done several albums in there. And when I moved down to the Atlanta area, you know, I recorded in Christian Bush's Sugarland studio and I went to Nashville and, and um, one day I was, uh, you can see bookshelves behind me here. Uh, somebody built those for me and I was filling in with books and tapes and LPs and such. And I had, I had, um, iTunes on sort of random and all of a sudden something from one of my old albums played and I never listened to my old albums um, and I thought oh my voice sounds really good it hasn't sounded this good since <laughs> so that's when I went back to bias and and during at Bob as you know during the pandemic I wrote a bunch of albums and some of them the, the last two were a process of recording right here my parts and sending them to Bob and Bob sending them to the to JT the bass player and John Carroll the piano player and Stuart Duncan the fiddle player and having them each put on their parts and um it was so nice to play live oh yeah because yeah. that's nothing what, like it nothing like it wow yeah so so with Ukrainian now uh were you all in the same studio or did people send in tracks no, we are you got a you got a heavy hitters here. Yeah, Holly Near. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that's fantastic. Yeah. And um and with all the with this was all done I and we went to Nashville to record Stuart and the great Charlie McCoy, the Country Music Hall of Fame harmonica player, um, who I I'd, I'd never worked with. Had you worked with Charlie before, Tom? No. Yeah. He was a lovely guy, short little guy. Oh, he's he's <laughs> <fun. Good laughs> Yeah, he's a little good joke teller. Yeah, yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah, very much. He can play on... anything. Yeah. He, yeah, he yeah. can he can play any kind of music you want to lay in front of him. You know, he'll he'll get right in it. And he told me he was doing a bluegrass album. Um, that was his next project. So, a bluegrass album with harmonica as the lead instrument. That'll be interesting. Wow. And he's I mean he knows all the best guys so. He does. Well, he played with Elvis. Wow. Played with, you know, Johnny Cash and... And, uh, and Tom Paxson and John McCutcheon, so there you go. It's yeah. Sort of, it's oh, all yeah. Up there. They kind <laughs> of tied it all in a bow, right? right. There, right? <laughs> Before I die, I want to... <laughs> yep. Yeah, he's very much featured on this campfire. It's a yeah. great track. Nice slow lilting. Uh, yeah, I love the harmonica on that. Well, that was that's one of my that's one of my very favorite songs on this album. I love that chorus. I think it's it's a really good singing chorus. And you know what was really interesting is we're recording this, and Bob says, and and, and you know we had intentionally um, sort of tried to imagine. Okay, Stuart, you're not you wouldn't have a fiddle out on the road uh, out on the campfire. You'll have a mandolin. So play that. There's not going to be a piano. Play the accordion, John. Um, and Bob stops halfway through the, the basic and says, John, your guitar sounds too good. You wouldn't have a guitar that good out there. And he goes to the closet and he pulls out an old silver tone guitar, which was, <laughs> which was the brand of the guitar I started playing when I was 18. And it was really emotional for me to play this really crappy sounding guitar on this and at the end of it he gave it to me um probably just to clean out his closet but it was yeah that that's one of the early songs we wrote and yeah when we wrote that chorus it was oh this is just such it was like putting on an old pair of boots yeah yeah it was yeah you got some very heavy tracks in there letters from joe it really oh, that could oh just... my god 
punch uh, here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a first take. That's a first take. Yeah. And Bob turned to me after Tom sang that, and he said, should we do another one? I said, not on your life. That was, yeah. that was perfect. It was exactly what it should have been. Yeah, sometimes you catch lightning in a bottle once, and it's like, nah, we don't yeah. need to do this again. It, it reminds such, me of that. It's such a great story. Uh, I mean, it's almost, I, I can't believe we wrote that. <laughs> yeah, I can't either. Uh, just an evocative story. It's, you know, for your listeners, um, you know, it's a story about a guy helping his brother remodel a house and in this in he's taken out a wall and in the studs of the in the in the inner studs of the wall, he finds this box of letters. And it turns out to be from this guy who went out to fight in World War II to to his, his wife, I guess, our sweetheart, and you're all of a sudden you're not only it's a story within a story which was really great because you know you're right there with the guy and he finds the box and all of a sudden you're reading the letters and it's like whoa i'm back in 1943. um it was it's great song great delivery and when we when we when tom does that in our concerts i mean it's like it's almost like people don't know if they should applaud at the end of it so intimate yeah, you can probably hear a, a needle drop, I'm sure. So you know, instead of those old bars yeah. where they're using you as background music, this is like a completely yeah. different experience. Yeah, yeah. That's not some of the same old crap. No, <laughs> that's, new. that's new and it's not crap. <laughs> yeah, do the work is, is a little bit more punchier. That's like on the other end of the <laughs> spectrum. That's, uh, yeah. I felt like you got a little funkier there. Yeah. Do the work. Yeah, my recollection is we were just talking about songwriting in general and and you know, yeah, there's lightning in a bottle. Yeah, there's there's this inexplicable thing that happens when you just follow the song and see where it leads you. But you you know, it's my number you know, when I'm doing workshops, my number one rule is ass in chair. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta um, do- my late wife uh, told me once that um, psychology had found uh, uh, had found a connection between moving a pen on paper and a corner of the brain that generates ideas. And I I think it could even extend to conversation. Also stimulates the brain for ideas. I mean, that when we, we always start by talking about, you know, sports or, or uh, gossip or, or you know, who's, who's, who's in trouble uh, physically. And, and, uh, and they, uh, only then do we say, well, you know, what do we got here? And uh, I almost never come to the sessions with an idea to bring. I always generate the idea once we're there. And I found what I did this I do now when I'm teaching is I start them with five minutes of um, what well, you can call it automatic writing. Um, five minutes of writing without letting the pen leave the paper. Uh, it doesn't matter. any uh, Whatever they write, they'll never even look at it again. But they write for five minutes and I think that that alerts the brain and that they'll, I then ask them to write a song in five minutes. And they, they do that too. They say, well, it's impossible, but they do it. Um, and I think it's because of the five minutes of just moving a pen. Mm. So uh, getting started is never that difficult for John or for me. Yeah. Um, and we usually, I mean, our fail rate is, is pretty low, I think. Uh, there's not many songs that we write are stinkers. And the one, the songs that I write by myself, um, I have a much higher fail rate. You know, it, I, I'll get maybe one in five 
uh, is is worth rewriting. Um, but I think we do a little better average than that. It, yeah, and I think that one of the things that's happened for me in this collaboration, and 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 both of us write with lots of people. Um, yeah, is that I learned how to be a a good co writer during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, you, you learn to be generous, you learn to be, uh, flexible, um, you learn to listen. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, every now and again, one of us will get on fire. Yeah. And we're barreling down the road and it's, it's, there's, there's, we're old enough and we've been pals long enough that there's no ego in this. No. Oh, I want this to be half my song. No, it's like, go baby, go. Keep yeah. Going. Run. You're on fire. Um, and all that has, uh, you know, I have the feeling now I could write with anybody. Yeah. Just because of the lessons I've learned from this collaboration. So it's it's not only the songs you get from it, you know. Yeah, you, you like your partner to get you on fire. You say, yeah. hey, yeah, I'll, I'll, take 50, I'll take 50% of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go, go, go. And, and this is, this is, I'm a, uh, yeah, this is unartificial intelligence at work. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. 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 So, so you were both teachers. Have you both like gone and actually held workshops and, and taught your writing styles? Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I love teaching. I love it. Yeah. I remember the first time I ever did a, an entire camp on my own, which was down at the Highlander center in East Tennessee. I remember talking to my agent afterwards and I said, God, if I could make any money doing this, I would yeah. do it a lot, but part of the part of the is for me is the is the joy of opening up someone to the possibilities of their own skills, um, and also, you know, I feel like we're populating the world with more songwriters, and considering that we live in a culture where. Uh, you know, the average person is is conditioned to be a consumer of music rather than a creator of it. You realize how crazy and, and radical writing your own songs is and how life expanding. And, you know, most of the people who come to my workshops are not going to end up being professional musicians or songwriters. But when somebody retires in their office or where their grandmother turns 90 or if they need a new song for their church or whatever, or when the, you know, when their first grandchild is born, they have, yeah. <laughs> they have something to do. They can become yeah. the songwriter laureate in their yeah. family or their union or their office or whatever. And that's, that's a great, great thing. Beautiful. Or, or, the, or they can, uh, things will happen in their family where people will say, Oh God, here comes grandpa with his guitar. <laughs> <laughs> they can oh, become notorious in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, oh God, you know, I really screwed up and that's going to be memorialized for. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. There's going to be a song about this and the family. Oh my God. Well, and, I mean, it's, though it's kind of fun, you know, when there's a wedding or there's a birth or whatever in our family, at some point during the events, people will stop and go, well, yep, yeah, it's what it's what he does. Yeah, it sounds like something in a comedy movie, like, you know, one of those yeah. Judd Apatow movies, like I could see yeah, characters yeah. like that. Yeah, it's uh, really sweet. Yeah, what a great project. So you had 100 songs. Throughout Something the pandemic, like how did you whittle it down to the 14? That's uh, that must have been a tough task. Well, the songs kind of do that for you. Yeah, yeah. You go down the list and say, Oh my god, we got to do this one. Well, and you know, it, it, yeah, yeah, there were some that were no brainers. We knew we, we needed to get Ukrainian now out there, and I think that song especially now that there seems to be a wavering on the part of some of our leaders to continue to support a, you know a democracy in danger um yeah that we wanted you know there were there were some no-brainers on this um yeah. but, but there were some that you know were big you know 
big favorites of one of ours or the other. And it was a lot like co-writing. Yeah, yeah. Well, that one doesn't ring the bell quite as much for me. But if you really yeah. love it, oh, yeah, let's do it. We, you know, and now it's, um, you know, we got plenty for another album, but we're writing all the time. So yeah. we'll be we'll Keep- be. We'll be presented with problems again. <laughs> yeah, I was just I was just thinking of uh, uh, Christmas in the desert. I want I want to put out a single of that. Yeah, uh, I don't know how you do that nowadays, uh, but I, I want that song to be heard during the Christmas season because I re- I really like it a lot. Yeah. Well, we recently just I sh- I should mention. Bob, that we have another thing at three. So we need to stop within the next five minutes. Um, that is you, totally fine. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, when we were doing a, our live shows this last weekend, it was like, it was, we we had all these songs from that we thought we ought to do from the album. And normally when you go out, you do maybe half the show from the new album. And then you do your old favorites. And Lord knows Tom has lots of old favorites in the audience. Oh, yeah. Uh, but we ended up essentially doing the entire album. We did. Um, That's great. That's yeah, great. Really, and I didn't hear a lot of complaints at the end saying, I want no, to do no. yeah. that. You didn't do so and so. No, yeah. I get. No, Excellent. No yeah. complaints. Total respect for for artists who who do that. Um, comes to mind is Peter Gabriel. He did so many of his new songs. He never came here to Atlanta, <laughs> but that that's an artist who's been around for ages, and he did yeah. like eleven songs off his new forthcoming album. I, I have total respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, so great to speak with both of you. The album. Thank is- you, Bob together and it's available wherever you get music these days it's digital but it's isn't it nice to get the vinyl it's i'm sure it's a beautiful packaging now go down to decatur cd there we go warren will have some yeah now is walk street still around this is an atlanta thing is it walk street i haven't been down that way in a while that was i haven't been down there warren warren is my guy yeah that's where i always go Go over to decatur cd decatur georgia yeah absolutely well thank you so much for stopping by Take you're care. welcome bob it's always welcome. nice to share a corner with you always always i gotta see you at eddie's attic one of these days i keep promising I'll, I'll be there in february awesome awesome take care have a good one okay bye-bye and i hope you enjoyed that and stay tuned i got a lot more interviews many more legends ready to come on this show so take care have a good one and i hope you had a great thanksgiving and Let's hear it for December.